Hello, and welcome back. This is Chapter 5, Video 7, where we'll be talking about identity, numerical quantification, and definite descriptions. So far with our quantifiers, we've been able to symbolize some pretty sophisticated claims and formulas, but the extent to which we've been numerically specific is limited. We can say sum, which of course means at least one, so it could be 2, 3, 537. We can also say all, which means everything in the universe of discourse, but of course, as the universe of discourse varies, that is a different number. And we can easily say none, which is actually the only specific case, meaning zero. What do we do if we want more specific numerical quantification? Well, we need to add an element to our language in order to achieve this. Let me demonstrate with a few examples. Take this sentence, given the interpretation on the right-hand side. There is at least one curator. This is something we're very used to. It's a simple matter of existential x, cx. And that gets us, there's at least one curator. But suppose we wanted to say, there are at least two curators. How are we going to symbolize this? Well, let's first take a look at some attempts that won't work. One attempt might be to say, some x, cx, and some y, cy. That won't actually work, because what it does is says there's at least one curator and there's at least one curator, with nothing to distinguish the first mentioned curator from the second. So as long as there is at least one curator, then both halves of this sentence will be true, making the whole conjunction true. So this does not get us what we want. Another attempt might be to overlap the scope of the two quantifiers. This perhaps gets us a little bit closer, but still is a mistake, because all it really says is that there is some x, such that there is some y, that x is a curator and y is a curator. But there's nothing to ensure that x is different from y. x might take the same value as y, so if there is only one curator, this is still true. We can find an object, say Fred, to go in for x, and Fred again to go in for y, and we'll get a true here, here, and therefore here, and therefore in both those places as well. So that attempt won't work either. What we need to do is somehow say that x and y are two different things. And actually, to do that, all we need to do is to add the identity predicate, or equal sign, to our language. It will look like this. We will have there is at least one thing x such that there is at least one thing y. x is not identical to y and each of them is a curator. This gives us what we want. What it says essentially is that there is some pair x, y, where they are distinct, not the same, and both of those are curators. Of course, this allows for more than two, because we could find various pairs. The one thing it doesn't allow for is there to be zero or only one. Now let me say something very briefly about this identity predicate. We use the equal sign, just as you're accustomed to in mathematics, to indicate that the objects denoted by the symbols either side of the identity sign are one and the same object. They're numerically identical. So if we write this, we have A is identical to B, or A is the same thing as B. We can, of course, use the identity predicate with variables, as we did on the left-hand side. x is the same thing as y, and in certain contexts we can even mix constants with variables. And, of course, we can negate the identity sign or equal sign just by slashing it, as you would do in mathematics. So there we have A is not identical to B, X is not identical to Y, and A is I not identical to X. We can also think of this denial of identity as an assertion of distinctness. They are, in fact, two different objects. 
And that is how over on the left hand side, we ensure that we get at least two. Let's see some more examples. How about there are at least three curators? Well, we're going to need three existential quantifiers with three different variables, and we're going to need to assert that the objects denoted by those three different variables must be distinct. So it'll look something like this. There is some x, there is some y, there is some z, and x is not identical to y, y is not identical to z, and x is not identical to z. Put proper parentheses around that, and then we need to say that each of them is a curator. So we'll have cx and cy and cz. A lot of parentheses here, but it's important to keep them straight. Um, and as you can see, if we were to do there at least four curators, it would get that much longer. But what we've got here is that there are at least three objects. No one of them is identical to any of the others, and each of them is a curator. So there's at least three. There could be four or five, but no fewer than three. A quick note here about the usage of the negated identity predicate. You might recall in mathematics that when three quantities are taken to be identical, you can abbreviate that with x equals y equals z. But you can't abbreviate non-identity in that way, because x could be non-identical to y, and y non-identical to z, while z is identical to x. So this won't work. And the reason is that identity is transitive, but non-identity not transitive. So we do need to do all three of these here, and it cannot be abbreviated. Even if we do want to assert that three things are identical, we'll have to spell it all out because this is not proper grammar for our language. Just one quick last example before we move on to more precise numeric quantification. Suppose we wanted to do, there are at least two curators who are knowledgeable. This is just a simple variation on there are at least two curators. We'll start it the same way. There's some x, there's some y. x and y are distinct that is to say non-identical, and now we just have to say curator and knowledgeable about each of x and y. Just like that. Note that because everything within the scope of the two existentials is just a very long conjunction, it doesn't necessarily have to be in this order. We can flip these two around, flip these two around, move the cy near the ky, and the kx and the cx near each other, and we can even move the position of this. As long as we have appropriate parentheses, because of commutivity, the order of that conjunction doesn't matter. I prefer to keep the non-identity claim, the distinctness claim, up near the existentials, so we can see that what we're doing here is getting at at least two. Similarly, in the longer ones, to make it clear that we've got three things, each of which is distinct from the others. One further thing to note, because identity and non-identity are commutative, the order here doesn't actually matter. You could switch it. Now we've seen how to do, in addition to at least one with the simple existential quantifier, we've seen how to do at least two, at least three, and we can extrapolate that to at least four, and so on, although those symbolizations get mighty long and unwieldy. What if we want to say exactly one, or exactly two, and so on? Well, let's think about that. Take there is exactly one curator. Obviously, a simple existential quantifier won't work, because that says there's at least one, so there could be two, three, four, so on. What do we need to do? So we want to start out with there is at least one curator, and now somehow say that there is no more than one. There's actually three different ways of doing this, although after seeing the three variations, we'll stick to one in particular. Here's one way of doing it. If there's exactly one curator, then what shouldn't exist? 
it's not the case that there is a y, where y is a curator also and distinct from x. So that's one way of getting it. Let me write this out. That's how we could read that one. There's at least one curator, and it's not the case that there exists a y that is a curator and distinct from x. Another way of writing that is this way. It starts out the same. There's at least one curator and for every y If y is distinct from x, if it's someone other than that curator, then that y is not a curator. A brief way of saying this in more logical language is there's at least one cur curator, and anything else for all y not x is not a curator. So there's two ways. And you'll notice, if you remember back, to the categorical square of opposition. A negated existential of this sort is a none claim in the upper right hand corner of the square, which is equivalent to this form, also a none claim. And of course, since this is a conjunction, these could come in the opposite order. Now those aren't the two favored ways of stating this. Here is the favored way of stating there's exactly one curator. It starts out the same. There's, a, there's at least one curator and for everything in the universe of discourse, why? If that why happens to be a curator, then it must actually be x. So what we get here is this. There's at least one curator, x, and if anything in the universe of discourse is a curator, then it's really just that same x. So there's at least one and no more than one. In fact, if we look at all three of these carefully, we can see the pattern. In each case, we have what we might call the existence condition, which is the same throughout the existence clause, there is at least one, and then the uniqueness clause, there is no more than one. And you see we have three different ways of stating the uniqueness clause. Those three different ways, of course, are quantificationally equivalent, so we're saying the same thing each time. But the bottom one here is the simplest one. Each of the other ones involves two negations. And this one doesn't require any negation. So that will actually be our favored form for translating this sort of formula. What I mean by favored form is not that it's more correct than the other two, but that's the form in which I'm going to give the answers in the videos and in the text. So there again we have there is exactly one curator. What if we wanted to say there are exactly two curators? Well, this also is going to have an existence portion and a uniqueness, or at least no more than two, portion. So we're going to need to say there are at least two and there are no more than two. And you'll recall from a little bit earlier how we do there are at least two. We need to say there's some x, there's some y, they're distinct, and both are curators. That's our existence portion. We've got at least two curators. And now we need to say for any z, if z is a curator, we want no more than two. So if anything in the universe of discourse is a curator, then it must either be x or y. So we have either x equals z or y equals z. Close the parentheses for the consequent there, close the parentheses for the universal quantification, and close the brackets for the two existential quantifications. Now this is a fairly complicated formula, but it's not too difficult to construct or understand. We have the existence portion, 
at least two. And then we have the uniqueness or dueikness portion, no more than two. So that gets us exactly two. You can imagine we can do exactly three as well. We'd have to have three existentials out front. We'd have to have the three denials of identity. We'd have to say of each of the variables x, y, and z that they're each curators. And then at the end, we'd have to have for all w, say, if c, w, then either x equals w or y equals w or z equals w. I'll write that out for you. So as you can see, it's awfully long and took me quite a while to write it out. Point is not that you would be writing very many sentences or formulas like this out, but the point is that you can. We can recover precise numeric quantification using the existential quantifier, the universal quantifier, and the identity sign. The last thing we'll look at here is how to do a definite description. Remember, a definite description is a phrase that starts with the and purports to pick out a unique object and then assert something of it. For example, take the sentence, the director is friendly. This portion here, the director, is the definite description. The use of the article the in most contexts here implies that there is just one director. And so we're going to interpret this as equivalent to there is exactly one director and he or she is friendly. So we can do that like this. We've already seen how to do there's exactly one director. So we get there's at least one x. x is a director. And for all y, if y is director, then it really is just x. So we get there is at least one director. And then out at the end here, we'll put on fx for x is friendly. So what we have here is an existence clause, a uniqueness clause, and the additional or predicate information. And we interpret the definite description as there is exactly one and what's attributed to that thing so described is put in here in what I'm calling the additional or predicate information portion of the translation give one last fairly straightforward example. So we have the knowledgeable educator is friendly and works for Kate. So we can see pretty clearly the definite description portion and then the additional information portion. And we'll symbolize it like this. So we've got there's at least one thing that is knowledgeable and an educator and for anything that is knowledgeable and an educator then it's just X again. So we've got existence and uniqueness and now we want to say x is friendly and x works for Kate. And we have to close the parentheses that reaches all the way back to here. And all our parentheses match. So those are the basics of using the identity symbol to do more specific numerical quantification, including precise numerical quantification, and also definite descriptions.